Hello everyone, this is Savannah Bekkowski, Project Assistant at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar entitled, Regulating Rates That Fund Customer Assistance Programs at Small Water Systems. To give you all of an idea of where others on the webinar are tuning in from, we have prepared this map. You can see that we have attendees spread all throughout the country. Thanks to you all for joining us today. Attendees can receive a certificate of attendance for viewing this webinar. This webinar has not been submitted to your licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing education credits. AWWA recommends that you check with your licensing agency to learn about its criteria, rules, and what you need to do in order to receive credit for your attendance. It is your responsibility to verify this information with your licensing agency. If you need assistance in applying for credit to your licensing agency, please contact Education Services at awwa.org. For attendees who already have an AWWA customer record, your certificate will be uploaded within 30 days of this webinar date. For attendees who do not have an AWWA customer record, you will receive an email from AWWA requesting you to create a customer record by a specific date to receive your certificate. If you do not create a customer record, you will not receive a certificate. This webinar session is one of several webinars conducted by the Environmental Finance Center Network for the Smart Management for Small Water Systems Project. The ESCN provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all 50 states and five territories to help local water systems achieve and maintain compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And here you can see the various centers that make up the Environmental Finance Center Network. You can see that we have centers spread all across the country. And here are the various areas of expertise that the ESCN focuses on. Workshops, trainings, and direct technical assistance are provided on asset management, rate setting and fiscal planning, leadership through decision making and communication, water loss reduction, energy management planning, accessing infrastructure financing programs, workforce development, water conservation, collaborating with other water systems, resiliency planning, and managing drought. The ESCN also provides a small systems blog. You can learn more about water finance and management through this blog. Blog posts feature lessons learned from our trainings and technical assistance, descriptions of available tools, and small systems success stories. You will have an opportunity to subscribe to this blog at the end of the webinar. In addition to workshops, direct technical assistance, and webinars, as part of the Smart Management for Small Water Systems Project, we are also creating a table that lists the major funding sources for drinking water infrastructure projects in each state and territory. Here's how you can access those tables. From the ESCN homepage, go to the Resources tab, and then click on Funding Sources by State. This will take you to a map of the country. If you click on the state you're interested in, you will find a PDF table of the relevant funding sources for drinking water infrastructure in that state. The table looks like the image on the left-hand side of the slide. For each funding program, it will include the name of the program, a short description, and contact information for someone who works in the program. And quickly, we do want to make you aware of a few of the upcoming workshops that the ESCN is hosting this month. You can learn more about specific events on the ESCnetwork.org website. And that also goes to for the upcoming webinars. You can learn more about those specific sessions on the ESCnetwork.org website. And now before I turn the presentation over to our presenter, I do have two quick polling questions for you. The first one is, what kind of drinking water utility do you represent? Please select from one of the following, a for-profit, a municipality, a non-for-profit, a special purpose dis district, or you're not from a water or sewer utility. And we'll leave that poll open for about another five seconds. Getting ready to close that poll in three, two, one. As you can see, a majority of us are not from a water utility, but we're followed close by 24% that are part of a municipal utility. And next polling question is what size system does your utility operate by number of people served? Please select from one of the following. Very small, small, medium, large or very large, or not from a water or sewer utility. And we'll leave that poll open for another five seconds. Getting ready to close that poll in three, two, one. 
As you can see, <laughs> as expected from the last polling question, the majority of us are not from a water utility, but then we're followed by small water systems. At this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to our presenter. For our webinar today, we have Stacy Isaac Brother. He's Senior Program Director at the Environmental Finance Center at the University of North Carolina on Chapel Hill. Stacy, welcome and take it away. Great. Thank you, Savannah, and hello, everyone. Okay, hopefully we are up and running here and you're seeing my, my slides. Good to go. Excellent. Okay, as Savannah mentioned, I am with uh, the Environmental Finance Center that's based at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, and I actually work for a satellite office in the state of Georgia in the Atlanta metro area, though. Um, at the EFC, we like to say our tagline is how you pay for it matters. Um, because how you pay for a project has education implications for the public, uh, for, or for the customers you serve. Um, it also has policy implications. So we, we like to kind of tease out the different financing mechanisms for environmental projects, primarily water, wastewater, and stormwater projects. We do some energy work, but definitely water is our main area. We do applied research, we do teaching and outreach like today's webinar, and we do some program design and evaluation as well. We work with several students every year um, on, some of them help us with their, with their master's thesis topic, for instance, being one of the projects that we're working on. So there's a good synergy there. In terms of today's webinar, um, I'd like to kind of go over the objectives. So we want to demonstrate some of the main challenges that small drinking water systems across the United States face. We will also look at how custom affordability issues can be measured at the water utility. That would be very brief. Um, and we'll take you through some of the ways that the water utility can address any affordability concerns that they happen to find from, um, from measuring affordability in their community. We'll pay special attention to the role that rate revenues from the water system can play in addressing this growing concern of customer affordability. So hopefully that's what you signed in today to hear about. Um, in terms of an introduction, today most of our webinar participants are from two pretty distinct groups. Uh, from what we can tell, these two groups probably don't interact too much. So part of our goal is to tell you a little bit more about each other, right? So small water systems meet the commissions, and commissions meet small water systems. So we'll do a little bit of that um, at first. So in terms of commissions, who, who are they? Well, first of all, the names of the commission in your state. Let's talk a little bit about that for, for a minute here. Usually the commission is called something like the Public Utilities Commission or the Public Service Commission. But there are other examples. This is going to be a theme throughout the, the webinar today. There are general rules and then there are exceptions, of course. So there are some, um, there are some states for example, uh, in Alaska, it's called the Regulatory Commission of Alaska. Of Alaska. Um, Arizona calls it the Arizona Corporation Commission. And the state of Tennessee doesn't actually have the Wood Commission in its, its name. It's the Tennessee Regulatory Authority. So we have some variations there. But for the majority of states, PUC or PSC, standing for Public Utilities Commission or Public Service Commission, will help you identify the group uh, that we're talking about. So apart from the names, what does this commission do in each state? Well, typically, the commission acts as an economic or financial regulatory body that governs certain rate setting um, practices and certain building practices of select utilities. And that term, select utilities, is underlined because it differs from state to state which set or group of utilities are actually governed by these commissions. So uh, I'll also mention here that there are six states, um, Georgia, Michigan, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, and the District of Columbia, in which uh, private water and wastewater companies uh, are not regulated by the State Utility Commission. So that's uh, one of those exceptions that I was, I was mentioning that are going to be sort of a theme throughout today's webinar. Small water systems. So we've introduced the commissions. Let's introduce the small water systems that are 
participating on the webinar today a little bit. So who are these small water systems? Well, this is just a picture uh, of some staff from a group of small water systems that happen to be um, in the state of Utah. We had a workshop there a couple weeks ago, and I know Savannah was showing you where the upcoming workshops are, the in-person actual face-to-face -face workshops. Well, this one was in Utah a couple weeks ago, and this is just a, a quick snapshot of some of the folks who were in the room working on a, a rate setting exercise. Now, what's important to, to bear in mind here is that when we're talking about really small communities that serve 10,000 and below in population, sometimes the folks in this room here that you're seeing, they are not only the water operator for their small water system, but they're also the dog catcher, and they wear many different hats. Um, so that gives us some framework that these folks, um, they have full plates and they're doing a, a lot of different types of duties at their small communities and their small system. There are lots of these types of systems. So in the United States, there are 147, there are more than 147 public drinking water systems. The word public, uh, let's talk about that for a second. In terms of a couple of clarifications for both of our, our main groups on the webinar today. Uh, public refers to the, the ownership. Um, I'm sorry, public water systems are publicly regulated by, by the EPA, regardless of whether they are owned privately or publicly. So you can have um, a public water system, the term here meaning publicly that they are regulated by EPA in terms of um, drinking water quality standards, for instance but that public water system can actually be owned by, let's say, investors. It can be an investor-owned utility. So sometimes those terms can be a little bit confusing if you're not too used to the industry. On the commission side, in general, commissions tend to regulate privately owned water systems, but again, there are exceptions to that. EPA, for its type of regulation, so remember the commissions regulate some utilities in in each state based on financial and economic um, factors. But EPA, of course, looks at drinking water standards and that kind of thing. Arsenic levels, lead levels, that's where EPA comes in. So EPA dis uh, divides public water systems into three main categories. You have community water systems, non-transient, non-community water systems, and then finally transient, non-community water systems. The type of system depends on who they serve. So you can see here, for example, we have the acronyms going forward, um, but community water systems, for instance, serve the same 25 or more people um, or 15 or more connections regularly where they live. And I'll let you, you know, just uh, look at the others for reference. Most water systems uh, are transient non-community systems, as you can see here. That TNC bar at the bottom is, is the longest bar on that chart. EPA also has a way of dividing the systems into five categories based on size. Size meaning, in this case, the number of people that are served by the system. So today we're going to be sm focusing on small systems, that is systems that serve 10,000 or below in population. Um, but even Within the category of small systems, EPA sent, tends to subdivide into very small, small, and, and medium. So terminology there, just kind of getting some of those terms straight sometimes is important at the outset. So most water systems are small. They serve 10,000 or fewer customers. And that's really very key. So 97% of the systems in the country are serving 10,000 or fewer customers. Collectively, though, large systems serve far more people, total people, that is. Almost all non-community systems are small, as you can see these numbers on the slide here. And most community systems are also small. In fact, a lot of them are very small. So why have we spent the last two minutes looking at size? Why does size matter so much when it comes to small systems? What's the issue with small systems? Well, there are a couple um, that we want to highlight. The infrastructure needs per residential 
connection are much higher for small systems. So that's a challenge in itself right there. Um, all systems across the country essentially are struggling with keeping up with their infrastructure needs and paying for infrastructure upkeep and replacement. And to know that the burden is a little bit higher for small systems per connection is, is quite a challenge. Small systems, probably partly reflective of that last slide, they have higher numbers of uh, annual health violations. So that's a concern for the EPA that these small systems um, need some more assistance and support to reduce the number of annual health violations. Small systems have several other challenges, of course. Um, there is, to some extent, increasing pressure to merge systems together. Um, it's a very capit uh, capital or asset intense um, industry, so that's a challenge in itself. Uh, a lot of them are seeing reduced revenues. It says sagging revenues on the slide. Sometimes if a small system use, loses um, a major customer, so let's say a commercial customer, uh, it's a big hit uh, on, on, on a small system because they just don't have large enough numbers of customers to kind of spread those impacts among. Another concern for small systems and large systems as well is this idea of affordability. So for today's webinar, I want to just kind of clarify also the term affordability. When we use that term, we're not talking about financial capacity of the utility itself. Instead, we are talking uh, about affordability from the customer level. Um, these two terms represent distinct concepts, but they are often confused and combined. So they are related, but, but distinct and separate concepts. So we will look at affordability again from the customer level. An example of a definition comes from the American Water Works Association's M1 manual, where they define affordability as the inability of the poorest segment of the customer base to fund its, its proportionate share of the total cost of the provision of utility services. So again, the customer level. My guess is that folks have signed up for this webinar because they see the importance of um, affordability for drinking water systems. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. Beyond altruistic reasons and just wanting to help um, people in your community, when customers have trouble paying their utility bills, there's an actual dollar value that can be associated with it. It affects the utility's bottom line in terms of increased arrearages, late payments, um, the costs associated with sending disconnection notices and service terminations. Sometimes you lose the customer altogether. Um, and so there are financial implications to having a high level of uh, non-payment among your water customers. But one of the first things that you should consider at the utility level, or that eight utilities should consider, is is there even an affordability program? Are our rates right now too high? And for most of the systems, generally the answer is that the rates are probably not too high, um, at least overall. We find that you know water and wastewater rates are still playing catch up um, where they cover the true cost or the full cost of providing the service. Um, they've been historically cheap. Water has been historically underpriced generally in the country. And there's been a there's been a lot of effort recently at the utility level to increase those prices. But still a lot of systems generally do not have rates that we would consider to be unaffordable overall. But there may be a sector of your customers for which the rates are actually uh, unaffordable. And if that sector of your customer group is growing, then it's, um, it's reason to, to pay attention to this issue. So if we look at water and wastewater residential rates, and we try to determine this idea of affordability, you know, a commonly used metric to measure level of affordability is the median household income. This tool that was created tries to look beyond just the MHI. There are a lot of um, problems or limitations associated with using median household income um, to gauge water affordability. And just the term median gives a hint. It looks at the middle income person. So you, if you think of ranking the income for your your service population from highest to lowest is that middle number. But as utilities, we should also be concerned about the folks 
who make the lowest 10% or the lowest 20% of income in our community uh, income distribution. So this tool looks at several other ways to measure affordability to decide do you have an affordability concern at your system. I'm going to use my mouse here to show you. You'll see a close-up of this chart in a, in a second. If you want to get an actual example um, of how to use this tool, there was a previous webinar that was recorded that actually gives you a, a demonstration of uh, how to use the tool and how to access it. For today, we're just going to look at a couple charts that sort of are spit out by the tool. So one of the things it will give you is um, the affordability. Uh, in this case, we use water and wastewater rates, but you can do you can run the tool for um, water only, obviously. <coughs> Excuse me. So this tool is showing you this uh, chart. Sorry, is showing you a sample community, and we looked at water and wastewater rates uh, at five thousand gallons per month, um, and the financial or income data we had was from two thousand fifteen. And you can see basically at, at the community or utility level, you look at these bars here and you say, well, if this customer is spending, you know, more than 14% of these customers are spending more than 14% of their income on water and wastewater, is that too high? So the community has to make the decision about how high these bars are allowed to be. Um, and as I mentioned, we don't, we don't want to limit ourselves to... Um, the mean household income only. So this table here shows one of the outputs of the tool where it's measuring affordability not just based on the popular indicator of mean household income, but we also look at the unemployment level in the community or the folks that are not in the labor force, people on social security income, people on um, receiving food stamp benefits, etc. So several different um, indicators or metrics from the census uh, are used here to, to indicate a more holistic picture of the level of affordability in your community. Now let's say you found um, that you've run through this tool and you do feel like there's an affordability program problem sorry for you, for your community then what are your options? So at this point, we're gonna we're gonna switch on into designing customer assistance programs or CAPS to address affordability concerns. But before that, Savannah is going to pull up two more polling questions just to make sure everybody's still awake. Thank you, Stacy. So the first polling question we have is: In your opinion, are the water rates in your utility or state generally affordable to customers? And please select from one of the following. Yes, no, or I don't know. And we'll leave this poll question open for another five seconds. And getting ready to close that poll in three, two, one. And Stacey, are you able to see those results? Um, no. Do you mind running through them? Of course. So we have 85% of attendees agreeing with yes. 6% say no, and 9% of attendees say I don't know. Interesting. Okay. That's helpful feedback. Uh, and then we have a, a second poll as well that Savannah, you're going to pull up now. And our second poll question is, are rates that fund a customer assistance program legal in your state? And again, please select from one of the following, yes, no, or I don't know. And we'll leave this poll open for about another five seconds. Getting ready to close the poll in three, two, one. And so Stacey, 71% of attendees say that they do not know if funds for a customer assistance program are legal. 19% say yes, and 10% say no. Okay, great. That Those are some interesting and not surprising um, responses there. So we'll, we'll get into why a lot of folks don't even know if they can use uh, rate revenue to, to fund the cap. So let's talk about, let's go back to this question here of, you know, maybe you found that you did not really like these numbers. So this example is from 
the city of Atlanta in Georgia. Um, and if, if the city of Atlanta, for instance, looks at these numbers and says, you know, some of them are too high, we'd like to design some sort of a, an assistance program, which um, coincidentally Atlanta does have a customer assistance program called the Care and Conserve Program. But what, what are the elements of putting together some sort of program to help these customers who may be having problems paying their bills? So some of the elements to consider are deciding who gets assistance, what type of assistance they, they receive, um, as well as planning for program outreach and monitoring so you can improve the program with time, and determining how much the customer assistance program will cost. But today we're going to focus in on this last bullet, which is devising a plan to fund the customer assistance program. How do you pay for the thing? Who gets the assistance? This looks at you have to come up with some eligibility criteria uh, to let folks into your program for customer assistance. And here we recommend that you partner with a, another organization that focuses on low-income groups and low-income programs. That's not usually one of the main business practices of water utilities. So we highly recommend partnering with another group in your community that may already be working with these uh, groups of individuals and have different eligibility or income verification um, processes that they can run through. Uh, we also feel like you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of existing programs, like some of them that I showed you in the table before, such as uh, food stamps, that already determine eligibility for these low-income programs. So we would recommend piggybacking off of one of these instead of, like I said, reinventing the wheel or creating your own criteria. So that's a suggestion there. Deciding who gets assistance. So this concept of a, a lifeline rate, again, from that same AWWA or American Water Works Association's M1 manual on fees and rates for water systems, they define a lifeline rate as something that provides a minimal amount of water at a reduced cost to all customers, regardless of income level or the ability to pay. So in this case, it's almost, it's basically underpricing the first um, level or first increment of water sales. So each customer pays below cost for the first couple thousand gallons, for instance, and then the rates um, increase after that. So oftentimes, um, some consumption amount is included in this fix or base charge. This example that I'm going to give you here is from the state of Alabama. Uh, we did a statewide rate survey for them in 2016, and we found that a lot of the systems, so a large number of residential rate structures, 93% um, of water systems and 67% of wastewater rate structures in the state of Alabama included a minimum amount of water consumption or wastewater disposal with their base charge. And so that's what this diagram is showing. You can see that this, if we look at blue for water only, this, this blue bar is showing that a lot of the systems in Alabama are giving one to 2,000 gallons of water, quote unquote, for free with um, the base or fixed charge. And so a lot of utilities say that this is how they address affordability um, by using this, uh, what we call a lifeline rate. The, the thing about lifeline rates is that it doesn't target a subset of your customers. It does not target the poorest customers. Um, this assistance, if you will, is for all of your customers. But holding in some more on a, a, a funding for these affordability programs. So one of the main ways that, well, the main way that utilities generate revenue for their projects is through their rates, rates and charges. So revenue generated directly from the customer rates is not, but it's not an option in some of the states. And that's that's what we want to look at next. So I'm going to give you up front the URL for this project. If you want to get more information, you can click on that um, when the slides are available after today's webinar. That's really a very important and really the key funding source for any water and wastewater system. Besides the rates revenue, you have voluntary contributions. Um, these would be bill roundup programs. So for instance, if my water bill is $52.27, maybe I write the check for 
$3, or maybe I even write it for $60. And that voluntary contribution um, is referred to as Bill Roundup, and that extra money can be used to help low-income customers. Um, so that's one way to fund an affordability program. And then you have uh, rental income, for example, from cell tower and so, sorry, from cell phone and internet providers. Uh, sometimes they rent space on water utilities, towers, and tanks, and that could be a nice, discreet part of money that could be used to help poorer customers. And then service line protection programs um, are also sort of an emerging way to fund these types of projects, um, programs. But if we look at rates revenue, which is really, like I said, the key source of income for water and even wastewater systems, what are some of the barriers there? And so this, we, we did a project where these seven um, water and wastewater organizations representing you know, private uh, and publicly owned water utilities and wastewater utilities, they came together to fund a project on this question of can you use rate revenue to fund a customer assistance program? And the research team, you can see there, UNC Environmental Finance Center, Corona, and APT. And then we had a couple independent legal experts helping on the project as well. So the question that we had, and you know, we are based at a university, so we, we function from the point of research questions quite a bit. The research question in this project was, can a utility use its primary revenue source, rate revenue, to fund a cap? And the project basically broke out like this. We did 52 state um, and territory legal snapshots. Uh, we did nine case studies of what we consider to be well-funded customer assistance programs. And then we did an analysis of other utility sectors. So we looked at the energy sector, for instance, and the telecommunication sector, how, how they fund um, their customer assistance programs. And then we looked at a couple international approaches as well from a couple different countries. This is a screenshot on the left of what the cover of the project looks like. So it's called Navigating Legal Pathways to Rate-Funded Customer Assistance Programs. And it's a guide for water and wastewater utilities. Um, on the right side of your screen, you'll see uh, just a, an image from the summary or the snapshot for the state of Alabama. So each state has basically a two-page summary uh, that uh, covers different aspects of it. If you look at that, that blue um, text box in the state summary gives you different metrics for the state of for the state of Alabama, and each state summary has one of those text boxes. So it looks at the state population. It looks at the typical annual household water and, and wastewater expenditure for that state to give you some context uh, of affordability concerns at the state level. What we found in doing this, this uh, research project was that it's pretty confusing and there's an ambiguous legal framework for any water utility that's trying to figure out can they use their rates revenue to fund a customer assistance program. <clears throat> so the utilities have to navigate a complex framework and it's, it's pretty confusing. In some cases, different types of utilities are subject to different rules that result in some utilities within a given state being able to design programs in a way that it's prohibited for other types of utilities. And the example I'll give there is California. So in California, government-owned utilities um, for those types of utilities in California, caps uh, are curbed. They're restricted um, by statutory and constitutional provisions. But in that same state, for an investor-owned utility or a utility that is privately owned, caps are very strongly encouraged. So it's, it's confusing. And when we say confusing, this, uh, this word cloud might give you an idea. In many states, in terms of how utilities set rates, this graphic hopefully helps to demonstrate that we basically pull the text that covered rate setting from each state's statutes. Um, and we did this word cloud on the most common terms. And this is, this is the result here. Words like just and reasonable are by far the most common. But these words are very subjective uh, in many ways. And so that is part of the 
that really, I think, gives you a graphic of the uncertainty and um, ambiguity of, of the language out there that, that deals with using rate revenue to fund a customer assistance program. So again, silence. In some states, it isn't mentioned. Um, other places, it's ambiguous or the language is restrictive. And some utilities, in a lot of cases, are unsure, which is, which is why we're not surprised by the poll results before, uh, where you guys were saying you don't know if you can use rate revenue in your given state to fund a customer assistance program. And without the use of rate revenue, most of the customer assistance programs that we see across the country they may be small and they may not have the capacity to address the total customer need. So the, the, the case here, or the argument is that um, we really need to clarify whether utilities can use their rates revenue to fund these kinds of programs. So the approach that we took um, is we categorized all of the states by the level of authorization for funding caps from rate revenue. We would have liked to say green, red, you know, yes, no. Yes, you can fund it with rate revenue or no, you cannot. But of course, things got a little bit more complicated. So we came up with these four categories where go is explicitly authorized. Um, and there were only a few states where we saw that it was clear in the statutes, et cetera, at that state that rates revenue were a bona fide way of funding a customer assistance programs. And then there were also a handful of states that are you know, represented here by this red stop sign, where it was clear that it was specifically prohibited to use rate revenue to fund a cap. Um, the majority of the states were somewhere in between in kind of those two caution areas, where there was no express authority, or um, it seems like you can use rate revenue, but we found a couple things that may potentially cause challenges if you design a program like that. And just to add a different level here, we talked about in the beginning the role of commissions in each state. And so we talked about as well that there's a subset of water and wastewater utilities in most states that is governed by this commission and the other utilities are not. So besides these four categories here um, of level of authorization, these images here on this table, we also um, broke the states down or divided, well, we, we divided between commission-regulated utilities in the state and non-commission-regulated utilities in the state. And this is what we found. So when we look at the group of states that are, sorry, the group of utilities in each state that's regulated by the commission, we found um, that very few had um, either explicit authorization or specifically prohibited using rates revenue. So the majority of states are sort of these two middle categories. Um, and the states in gray represent those that are not, that where, where no water or wastewater utilities are regulated by the commission. We said before that there were six of those. In terms of non-commission regulated utilities, so the utilities who are not regulated by the commission in that state, um, we found roughly similar picture. And I will mention that if you go to the website for this project that I showed earlier, the URL, you can actually click on the map um, and pull up the summary for your particular state without pulling up the whole 165 page report. So the two or three page summary for each state is available by clicking the map as a separate document. All right, so then here we're just giving an example, another example of a, a summary or state snapshot. And in this case, we, we're highlighting Wisconsin. And you're not meant to be able to, to read the text here, but again, it's giving you an idea of what the state snapshot looks like here are the statistics on the state, um, and then we, we kind of put the, the commission regulated rating and the non-commission regulated rating on each of the state summaries as well. So why Wisconsin? And I believe we have some folks from Wisconsin um, who had registered for the webinar today, but 
Regarding municipal wastewater utility regulation, when a customer complains to the Public Service Commission in Wisconsin that rates are unreasonable or unjustly discriminatory, the Commission shall hold a public hearing. If the Commission then determines that the rates are unreasonable or unjustly discriminatory, it shall fix and impose just and reasonable rates. So I'm reading some texts for you from the state of Wisconsin that uses words like just and reasonable that we had talked about before. Now, one of the things that makes Wisconsin unique is that all municipal-owned water utilities are regulated. So even the small ones are regulated by the State Utility Commission. And the main differences in terms of regulatory issues actually lie not between the ownership, whether it's a publicly owned or privately owned public water system, but the main difference is in Wisconsin, unlike all the other states, is that the difference lies more between water versus wastewater utilities. So this is just to give you an example, like I said, um, of some of the exceptions out there among the different states. Again, this is not a slide that you are meant to be able to read, but we found very little case law throughout the country that deals with this specific issue of using rates revenue to fund a customer assistance program. Um, this probably comes the closest. So this is a case from Wisconsin, and the issue there was um, charging everyone, all the, all the residential customers, a higher rate so that uh, lead could be addressed in some, in some pipes. And so it's an interesting example where two pretty hot uh, issues in the water and wastewater world right now that is affordability and lead, sort of come together. But basically, the finding was that uh, the proposed rate increase would be used to benefit a select group of customers by more or less providing a subsidy for the replacement of the privately owned lead laterals, which those customers are responsible for maintaining and repairing. So even though there was, I think, a little bit of risk to the, to the whole water system of these uh, private privately owned lead laterals, I guess, from the meter to the house. Yes, they're privately owned, um, but if they had lead in them, my understanding is it could, it could um, affect um, and introduce lead into the, the, the actual main water system. And so the utility was trying to raise revenues by, I'm sorry, raise rates to generate the revenue to, to fix these privately owned lead laterals. And, you know, the court finding that, um, that would benefit a select group of customers, um, they, they did not rule in favor of this, this increase. So it's the closest thing, like I said, that we can find to looking at how a, a commission or any, any kind of case law in the country looking at this idea or this question of can you use rate revenue to fund uh, a customer assistance program. So it's not totally on that topic, but like I said, the closest that we could find. So there, you know, we don't want to just stress that there's a lot of ambiguity without possibly suggesting some, some options. Uh, so we have some suggestions here as to what can be done to reduce this ambiguity. Uh, and that's one of the things that we hope to do with this Smart Management for Small Water Systems project is to um, help decrease the ambiguity um, for small systems in what they can and cannot do with their rates revenue when it comes to, to helping low-income customers. So one option that the research team kind of came up with from this project was at the state level, if the state can introduce language that clarifies um, affordability programs and how you can fund them, um, in clear, unambiguous terms, then that would be really helpful. That is outside, that is outside the, you know, the ability to control of the really small systems or any systems in the state, but you can, you can influence and try to educate some of the folks at the state level uh, that this language needs to be clarified and it would be helpful to the systems in the state if it is clarified. Option two, deals more at the utility level, so you have more control there as a small water system. And it's about developing an argument for why a customer assistance program actually conforms to the existing statutes and is not affected by perceived limitations. So 
An example there is uh, the city of Atlanta in Georgia. In Georgia, there is something called the gratuities clause. Just like all other states, it's, it's basically a gift clause. Um, but in Georgia, the way it's written as part of the state constitution, actually, it seems to limit the use of rate revenue to fund custom assistance program. Um, and so it seems to be unique among gift clauses. And it has been tested and, and been upheld. So it, is, um, it has been a significant hurdle to using rates revenue to fund custom assistance programs in the state. Um, up until fairly recently, when the city of Atlanta tried to address some of these concerns directly, they've changed um, the city code to write in language that addresses some of the, the limitations that the gratuities clause have, have caused in, in Georgia. Um, option three would be to develop some, some sort of alternative program that does not rely on direct customer rate revenue to fund the cap to your low-income customers. So there are examples of other utilities, for example, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, we have a case study on that utility where they have, they have found a way to fund a robust program, but not directly using uh, customer rate revenue. Okay, um, Savannah, I think you have a, a poll question now. Yes, so these are just um, a really quick uh, wrap-up polling questions. And the first one is, would you like to subscribe to the Environmental Finance Center blog? If you're unsure about signing up for the blog or do not have the opportunity to submit your polling answer today, you can sign up for the blog on our efcnetwork.org website. And getting ready to close that poll in three, two, one. And lastly, um, if you are a small water system of 10,000 or fewer people served, would you be interested in receiving in-depth technical assistance? If you are unsure about technical assistance or do not have the opportunity to submit your polling answer today, you can review the technical assistance form and request technical assistance on the efcnetwork.org website. And we will get ready to close that poll in three, two, one. And lastly, I'm pushing out a link through the chat box for a survey. If you could just take five minutes out of your day to let us know how you thought today's session went, that would be wonderful. And you will be receiving a follow-up email that indicates when these slides and recording are available for download. And so Stacy, there are no questions at this time. Let's see. So I do not have any questions from attendees at this time. So um, Stacey, I don't know if you have any last minute wrap up points we can let attendees think if they have any questions, but. Sure, and I kind of have a question uh, for some of the attendees that are with um, service commissions in particular. Um, have you ever been involved in a rate case where the water system was requesting an increase in rates in order to fund a customer assistance program or some sort of um, customer affordability or low income program. So again, the question for any of the utility commission folks who feel brave is, have you been involved in a case, a rate, a rate case, where part of the increase was to fund some sort of a, an assistance program for low income folks? And I think what they can probably do is raise their hand, Savannah, and then you can um, unmute them. Perfect. So um, I don't know if this is in response to the question you just asked, but an attendee did ask, how do you find out if your state allows for these programs? OK, that's a good question. I'm probably going to go back through um, some of our slides here. So on an earlier slide, I gave the URL for this. So you would go here, um, let's say that you are a commission regulated utility, and you'd probably need to read the two-page summary to find out if your utility is, is commission regulated. 
So I would go to the state. So in the case of, for example, Minnesota, well, no, let's choose a different one. Let's just choose Montana. I know we have folks um, who registered from Montana. You'd click on that state and it would pull up this two-page summary. I would take a quick look at that um, state summary or snapshot to see if the description there looks like you would be commission regulated. Um, and then if it doesn't look like you're commission regulated, then you would be non-commission regulated. And that gives you an indication. Um, then you can, you can also look just at this table here instead of going to the website, right? If you know that if you're commission regulated or non-commission regulated, you can look at this website, these uh, slides here, sorry, and see if your state is red. So let's look at California. Remember we said that in California, that one state, different groups of water utilities are regulated differently. So, well, they have different, different requirements, let's put it that way. So in California, if you're commission regulated, you are explicitly allowed to have a customer assistance program. So that state is in green. Um, in fact, it's strongly encouraged that you have a customer assistance program if you are a commission regulated utility in the state of California. So it's green there. But if we look at the next map that says non-commission regulated, California is now red. So sort of the publicly owned government type utilities in California, it looks as though they are not authorized. You know, they are specifically prohibited from using rate revenue to fund their cap. So the short answer is the color coding on this map, except you need to figure out whether you fall within commission regulated or non-commission regulated. Thank you, Stacy. So I did just send a reminder to the attendees if they would like to raise their hand to answer your question, or they can submit an answer through the question or chat box. Okay. I have not received any response for that. Um, would you like to give it a few more minutes, or what are your thoughts? Maybe a couple seconds. You got it. Minutes may be too much. And that, that question is, is sort of um, putting the commission folks on the spot, so I understand if none of them want to raise their hands. But sort of the goal here today was to um, get the commission uh, staff folks to understand a little bit more about the challenges that the really small drinking water systems face and to give the small drinking water systems an overview of these commissions um, that regulate at least the financial practices of some systems in their state. Wonderful. Well, and as you provide your contact information, if any attendees or commissions would like to follow up with you offline, that is also, I think, acceptable. <laughs> that, that would be very interesting. Um, so I'm going to go on here to a couple other resources from uh, the Environmental Finance Centers as a whole when it comes to affordability. So Savannah, just interrupt me if somebody does have a question, but I'll just focus on these last couple of slides here to, to finish this off. So um, a couple of years ago, we were asked to put together a compilation of all the different Environmental Finance Center um, resources that, that are focused on affordability. And so if you go to this URL right here, it will take you to that compilation. So it's not just the UNC at EFC, but all the EFCs who have done work in this area. Um, the EFC at UNC, though, does have a blog where we post on this topic of affordability pretty often. If you click on this um, link here, it will bring up the last 11 and counting posts that we have on this topic. And yeah, I also just should have mentioned that we have about a dozen rates dashboards um, for different states around the country, and each of the dashboards usually would have an affordability dial. So that's one quick and easy way, if you happen to be in one of our dashboard states, um, to get an idea of affordability of your utility within your, within your state's um, context. So it compares affordability levels for um, different amounts of water based on the other water and wastewater systems in that state. So those are some more resources about this topic, and we kind of went through the questions, but as Savannah suggested, this is my contact information if folks want to engage a little bit more on this topic. Um, 
And in terms of Twitter, I do uh, use hashtag water affordability when, when I have tweets that have to do with this topic. So you can, you can always kind of look for, for that, that trend. You're with us, Stacey. <laughs> so there have been no questions or hand raised at this point. So I will just, I just want to say thank you to you, Stacey, for providing your expertise on rates that fund customer assistance programs across the nation. And I want to thank all the attendees that joined us today. Oh, can, so we, an attendee did just ask if you could please show the slide in dealing with how much is needed per year for each system. Is that enough detail to go off, Stacey? <laughs> how much is needed per year? Oh, okay. Maybe, let's see, probably one of the earlier slides. So I think I understand the question. I think it has to do with um, the introduction where we talked about small systems and their sort of, let's see if I can find that. Bear with us here. Maybe it was this one that looked at the infrastructure needs per residential connection at small system. If it's not, please just send us a little bit more detail and I will pull that slide up. But to reiterate something that Savannah said earlier, we'll have all of these slides posted as a PDF um, that you can go to and that's especially useful for the long URLs that we have in here. You can, um, they'll be hyperlinked and you can click on those and get to different resources. Um, the other thing that I can do really quickly, in case this is not really answering the question, is pull up this, let's see, try right here. I'll pull up the web page where we have the actual project, just in case I didn't get to the right answer here. And you can always go to the UNC EFC website and type in what you're looking for here. But right now I happen to know that this affordability stuff is the most recent um, thing on our homepage. So you see here where you can access the report. And these maps will load here um, in a second. So it's commission regulated utilities and then you can toggle to non-commission regulated utilities. And the, the case studies, the nine case studies I mentioned are available here as these little blue gears, I guess. If you're looking for past presentations on the topic, they're over here on this side of your screen. So hopefully that, that covers it. Do we get any more details on that question, Savannah? No, the slide that you showed earlier was the correct one. That's the one. Okay, I see the I see the comment now. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, just to wrap it up, Stacy, thank you again for providing your expertise for today's webinar session. And again, thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. Um, Stacy, do you have any additional closing comments? No. Um, thank you all for your attention, and thank you for your moderating and assistance, Savannah. Of course. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day.